Hello and welcome to India Reads. My name is Pradeep and we are reading the story of my experiments with truth by M.K. Gandhi. Uh, we are uh, on page 520 which is just about 100 pages to go for the book to complete and uh, uh, we are in section 21. A peep into the ashram. Let's start. Before I proceed to describe the progress of the labor dispute as it is essential to have it is essential to have been in, into the ashram. All the while I was in Champaran, the ashram was never out of my mind. I occasionally created flying visits. At that time, the ashram was in Kochrap, a small village near Ahmedabad. Plague broke out in this village and I saw evident danger to the safety of the ashram children. It was impossible to keep ourselves immune from the effects of the surrounding insanitation. However, scrupulously, we might observe the rules of cleanliness within the ashram walls. We were not then equal either to getting the Kochra people to observe these rules, nor to serving the village otherwise. Our ideal was to have the ashram at a safe distance from both town and village, and yet at a manageable distance from either. And we were determined someday to settle on ground of our own. The plague I felt was sufficient notice to quit Koshra, Punjab, Bhai, Hirachan, a merchant in Ahmedabad had come in close contact with the ashram and used to serve us in a number of matters in a pure and selfless spirit. He had a wide experience of things in Ahmedabad and he volunteered to procure us suitable land. I went about with him north and south of Koshra in search of land and then suggested to him to find out a piece of land three or four miles to the north. He hit upon the present side, its vicinity to the Sabarmati Central Jail was for me a special attraction as jail going was understood to be the normal lot of Satyagrahis. I liked the position and I knew that the sites selected for jails generally have clean surroundings. It's in about eight days the, scale, the sale was executed, there was no building on the land and no trees but its situation on the banks of the river and its solitude were great advantages. We decided to start by living under canvas and having a thin shed for a kitchen till permanent houses were built. The ashram had been growing slowly. We were now over 40 souls, men, women and children having our meals at the common kitchen. The whole conception about the removal was mine. The execution was usual as usual left to Magalla. Our difficulties before we had a permanent living accommodation were great okay difficulties be great the rains were impending and provisions had to be got from the city four miles away the ground which had been a waste was infested with snakes and it was no small risk to live with the little children under such conditions the general rule was not to kill the snakes though i confess none of us shared had shed the fear of these reptiles nor have we even now the rule of not killing venomous reptiles had been practiced for the most part at Phoenix, Tolstoy Farm and Sabarwati. At each of these places we had to settle on wastelands. We have had, however, no loss of life occasioned by snake bite. I see with an eye of faith in this circumstances the hand of God of mercy. Let no one cavil at this, saying that God can never be partial and that he has no time to meddle with the humdrum affairs of men. I have no other language to express the fact of the matter, to describe this uniform experience of mine. Human language can be imperfectly, can but imperfectly describe God's ways. I am sensible to the fact that they are indescribable and inscrutable. If moral men will dare to describe them, there is, he has no better medium than his own inarticulate speech. Even if it be a superstition to believe that, Complete immunity from harm for 25 years in spite of a fairly regular practice of non-killing is not a fortuitous, for, fortuitous, fortuitous accident but a grace of God. I should still hug that superstition. During the strike of the mill lands in Ahmedabad, the foundation of the ashram weaving shed was being laid. For the principal activity of the ashram was then weaving. Spinning had, no, had not so far been possible for us. The first, the first two weeks, the mill lands exhibited great courage and self-restraint and held monster meetings. On these occasions, I used to remind them of their pledge and they would shout back to me the assurance that they would rather die than break their word. 
but at last they began to show signs of flagging just as physical weakness in man manifests in in irascibility the attitude towards the black legs became more and more menacing and as the strike seemed to weaken and i had begun to fear an outbreak of rowdyism on their part the attendance at their daily meetings began to dwindle by degrees and the despondency and the despair were writ large on the faces of those who did attend finally the information was brought to me that the strikers had begun to totter i felt trouble and set to thinking furiously as to what my duty was in the circumstances i had had experience of a gigantic strike in south africa but the situation that confronted me here was different the mill hands had taken a pledge at my suggestion they had repeated it before me day after day and the very idea that they might now go back upon it was to be inconceivable was it pride or was it my love for the laborers and my passionate regard for the truth that was at the back of this feeling who can say one morning it was at the mill hands meeting while i was still groping and unable to see my way clearly the light came to me unbidden and all by themselves the word came to my lips unless the strikers rally i declare to the meeting and continue the strike until till the settlement has reached or till they leave the mills together i will not touch any food The laborers were thunderstruck. Tears began to course down Anusya Bain's cheeks. The laborers broke out, "Not you! We shall fast. It would be monstrous if you were to fast. Please forgive us for our lapse. We will now remain faithful to our pledge to the end." There is no need to fast, I replied. It would be enough if you could remain true to your pledge. As you know, we are without funds and we do not want to continue our strike by living on public charity. You should therefore. try to eke a bare existence by some kind of labor so that you may be able to remain unconcerned no matter how long the strike may continue as for my fast it will be broken only up to the strike is settled in the meantime vallabhai was trying to find some employment for the strikers under the municipality there but there was not much hope for success there magalal gandhi suggested that as we needed sand for filling the foundation of our weaving school and ashram a number of them might be employed for that purpose the laborers welcomed the proposal anusya bain led the way with a basket on her head and soon an endless stream of laborers carrying baskets of sand on their head could be seen issuing out of the hollow of the river bread it was sight worth seeing the laborers felt themselves infused with a new strength and it became difficult to cope with the task of paying out wages to them my fast was not free from a grave defect for i for as i have already mentioned in a previous chapter i enjoyed very close and cordial relations with the mill owners and my fast could not but affect their decision as a satyagrahi i knew knew that i might not fast against them but ought to leave them free to be influenced by the mill hand strike alone my fast was undertaken not on the account of lapse by the mill owners but on account that of that of the laborers in which as their representative i felt i had a share with the mill owners i could only plead to fast against them would amount to coercion coercion yet in the spirit of my knowledge that my fast was bound to put pressure on them as in the fact it did i felt it could not help it i could not help it the duty to undertake it seemed to me to be clear i tried to set the mill owners at ease there is not the slightest necessity for you to withdraw from your position i said to them but they received my words coldly and even flung keen delicate bits of sarcasm at me as indeed they had a perfect right to do so the principal man at the back of the mill owners unbending strike towards unbending attitude towards the strike was said ambala his resolute will and transparency transparent sincerity were wonderful and captured my heart it was a pleasure to be pitched against him the strain produced by my fast upon the opposition of which he was the head cut me therefore to the quick and then sarla devi his wife was attracted attached to me with the affection of a blood sister and i could not bear to see her anguish on account of my action anushya bain and a number of other friends and laborers started the fast with me on the first day but after some difficulty i was able to dissuade them from continuing it further the net result of it was that an atmosphere of goodwill was created all around the hearts of the mill owners were touched and they set about discovering some means of settlement anusya bain's house became a venue of their discussion anand shankar dhruva intervened and was in the end appointed arbitrator 
and the strike was called off after I had fasted only for three days. The mill owners commemorated the event by distributing sweetmeats among the laborers and thus a settlement was reached after 21 days strike. At the meeting held to celebrate the event, both the mill workers and the commissioner was, were present. The advice which the latter gave to the mill hands on this occasion was, you should always act as Mr. Gandhi advises you. Almost immediately after these events, I had to engage in a tussle with this very gentleman. But circumstances were changed and he had changed with the circumstances. He then set about warning the Patidars of Kheda against following my advice. Uh, I must not close this chapter without noting here an incident as, as amusing as it was pathetic. It happened in connection with the distribution of sweets. The mill owners had ordered a large quantity and it was a problem how to distribute among the thousands of laborers. It was decided that it would be the fittest thing to distribute it in the open beneath the very tender tree under which the pledge had been taken especially as it would have been extremely inconvenient to assemble them all together in any other place i had it i had taken it for granted that the men who had observed street discipline for full 21 days would would without any difficulty be able to remain standing in an orderly manner while the sweets were being distributed and would not make an impatient scramble for them. But when it came to the test, all methods that were tried for making the distribution failed. Again and again, their ranks would break into confusion and distribution had proceeded for a couple of minutes. The leaders of the mill hands tried their best to restore order, but in vain. The confusion, the crash, crush and the scramble at last became so great that quite a number of sweets were spoiled by being trampled by f underfoot and the attempt to distribute them in an op in the open had finally to be given up. With difficulty we succeeded in taking the remaining sweets to St. Ambalal's bungalow in Mirzapur. Sweets were distributed comfortably the next day within the compounds of that bungalow. Uh, the comic side of this incident is obvious, but the pathetic side bears mention. Subsequent inquiry revealed the fact that the beggar population of Ahmedabad, having got the sin of the facts was that sweets were to be distributed under the Ektik tree, had gone there in large numbers, and it was their hungry scramble for the sweets that had caused all the order, all the confusion and disorder. The grinding poverty and starvation with which our country is afflicted in such is such that it drives more and more men every year into the ranks of beggars whose desperate struggle for bread renders them insensible to all feelings of decency and self-respect and our philanthropists instead of providing work for them and insisting on their working for bread give them arms. The Kheda Satyagra No breathing time was over was however in store for me hardly had the Ahmedabad mill strike got over when I had to plunge into the Kheda Satyagraha struggle. A condition approaching famine had arisen in the Kheda district owing to the widespread failure of the crops and the party that was of Kheda were considering the question of getting the revenue assessment of the year suspended. Uh, uh, Amritlal Thakkar had already inquired into and reported on the situation and personally discussed the question with the commissioner before I gave definite advice to the cultivator. Sergeants Mohanlal Pandya and Shankarlal Parikh had also thrown themselves into the fight and had set up an agitation in the Bombay Legislative Council uh, through Sergeant Vithal Bhai Patel and the late Sir Gokuldas Kahandas Parikh. More than one deputation had waited upon the governor in that connection. It was at this president of Gujarat Sabha, I was at this president of Gujarat Sabha, the Sabha sent petitions and telegrams to the government and even patiently swallowed the insults and threats to the commissioner. The conduct of the officials on this occasion was so ridiculous and undignified as to be almost incredible now. The cultivators demand were the cultivator's demand was as clear as daylight and so moderate as to make out a strong case for its acceptance. Under the land revenues rules, if the crop 
was four runners or under, the cultivators could claim full suspension of the revenue assessment for the year. According to official figures, the crop was said to be four runners. The contention of the cultivators was, on the other hand, on the other hand, was that it it was less than four runners. But the government was in no mood for to listen and regarded the popular demand for arbitration as laissez majeste. At last, all petitioning and prayer having failed to take counsel after taking counsel with co-workers, I advise the partisans to resort to Satyagraha. Besides the volunteers of Kheda, my principal comrades in the struggle were Vallabhai Patel, Shankar Lal Banker, Srimati Anusya Bain, Indula Yagnik, Mahadev De Sai and others. Vallabhai in joining the struggle had to suspend a splendid and growing practice at the bar which for all practical purposes he was never able to resume. We fixed our, fixed up our headquarters at the Nadiyat Anath Ashram, no other place being available which would have been large enough to accommodate all of us. The following pledge was signed by all Satyagris. Knowing that the crops of our village are less than four runners, we Knowing that the crops of our village are less than four annas, we requested the government to suspend the collection of revenue assessment till the ensuing year. But the government has not acceded to our prayer. Therefore, we, the undersigned, hereby solemnly declare that we shall not, of our own accord, pay to the government the full or remaining revenue for the year. We shall let the government take whatever legal steps it may think fit and gladly suffer the consequences of our non-payment. We shall rather let our lands be forfeited than that by voluntary payment. We should allow our case to be considered false or should compromise our self-respect. Should the government, however, agree to suspend collection of the second installment of the assessment throughout the district, such amongst us are in a position to pay up, will pay up the whole or balance of the revenue that may be due. The reason why the, those who are able to pay still withhold payment is that if they pay up, the poorer riots may in panic sell their shuttles or incur debts to pay up their dues and thereby bring suffering up upon themselves. In these circumstances, we feel that for the sake of the poor, it is the duty even of those who cannot, who can afford to pay to withhold payment of their assessment. I cannot devote many chapters to the struggle, so a number of sweet recollections in this connection will have to be crowded out. Those who want to make a fuller and deeper study of this important fight would do well to read the full and authentic history of the Kheda Satyagraha by Shankar Lal Parekh of Kathal Kheda. The Onion Thief Champaran being in a faraway corner of India and the press having been kept out of the campaign, it did not attract visitors from outside. Not so with the Kheda campaign, of which the happenings were reported in a press from day to day. The Gujaratis were deeply interested in the fight, which to them was a novel experiment. They were ready to pour out pour forth their riches for the success of the cause. It was not easy for them to see that the Satyagraha could not be could not be conducted by means of money. Money is the thing that it needs, it least needs. In spite of my remorse, remonstrance, the Bombay merchants sent us more money than necessary, so we had some balance left at the end of the campaign. At the same time, the Satyagrahi volunteers had to learn the new lesson of simplicity. I cannot say that they imbibed it fully, but they considerably changed their ways of life. For the Patidar farmers too, the fight was quite a new thing. We had therefore to go about from village to village explaining the principles of Satyagraha. The main thing was to rid the agriculturists of their fear of making them realize that the officials were not the masters, but the servants of the people. Inasmuch they received their salaries from the taxpayer and then it seemed well nigh impossible to make them realize the duty of combining civility with fearlessness. Once they had shed their fears of the officials, how could they be stopped from returning their insults? And yet, they, if they resorted to incivility, it would spoil their satyagraha like a drop of arsenic in milk. I realized later that they had less fully learned the lesson of civility than I had expected. Experience had taught me civility is the most difficult part of Satyagraha. Civility does not mean here the mere outward gentleness of speech cultivated for the occasion, but an inborn greatness, gentleness of speech cultivated for the occasion. I'm sorry.
uh, civility does not mean the mere outward gentleness of speech cultivated for the occasion, but an inborn gentleness and desire to do the opponent good. These should show themselves in every act of a satyagrahi. In the initial stages, though the people had exhibited much courage, the government did not seem inclined to take strong action. But as the people's firmness showed no signs of wavering, the government began coercion. The attachment officers sold people's cattle and seized whatever movables they could lay their hands on. Penalty notices were served and in some cases standing crops were attached. This unnerved the peasants, some of whom paid up their dues while others desired to place safe movables in the way of officials so that they might attach them to realize their dues. On the other hand, some were prepared to fight to the bitter end. While, while these things were going on, one of Shankarlal Parekh's tenants paid up the assessment in respect of his land. This created a sensation. Shankarlal Parekh immediately made amends for this tenant's mistake by giving away for charitable purposes the land for which the assessment had been paid. He thus saved his honor and set a good example for others. With a view of stealing the hearts of those who were frightened, I advised the people under the leadership of Mohanlal Pandya to remove the crop of onion from a field which had been, in my opinion, wrongly attached. I did not regard this as a civil disobedience, even if it was. I suggested that this attachment of standing crops, though it might be in accordance with the law, was morally I suggested that this attachment of standing crops, though it might be in accordance with the law, was morally wrong and was nothing short of looting, and that therefore it was the people's duty to remove the onion in spite of the order of the attachment. This was a good opportunity for the people to learn a lesson in quoting fines or imprisonment which was necessary consequence of such disobedience. For Mohanlal Pandya, it was a thing after his heart. He did not like the campaign to end without someone undergoing suffering in the shape of imprisonment for something done consistently with the principles of Satyagra. So he volunteered to remove the onion crop from the field and in this seven or eight friends joined him. It was impossible for the government to leave them free. The arrest of Mohanlal and his companions added to the people's enthusiasm. When the fear of jail disappears, repression puts heart into people. Crowds of them besieged the courthouse on the day of the hearing. Pandya and his companions were convicted and sentenced to a brief term of imprisonment. I was of the opinion that the conviction was wrong because the act of removing the onion crop could not come under the definition of theft in the penal code. But no appeal was filed as the policy was to avoid the law courts. A procession escorted the convicts to jail and on that day Mohanlal Pandya earned from the people the honored title of Dangli Chor, which is onion thief, which he enjoys to this day. The conclusion of the Kheda Satyagraha I will leave to the next chapter. Let's quote the next chapter. End of the Kheda Satyagraha. The campaign came to an unexpected end. It was clear that the people were exhausted and I hesitated to let the unbending be driven to utter ruin. I was casting about for some un for some graceful way of terminating the struggle, which could be acceptable to a Satyagrahi. A one such appeared quite unexpectedly. The Mam Mamladdar of Nadia Taluka sent me a word that if well-to-do Patidars paid up, the poorer ones would be granted suspension. I asked for a written, effect, written undertaking to that effect which was given. But as a Mamladdar could be responsible only for his Taluka, I inquired of a collector who alone could give an undertaking in respect of the whole district. Whether the Mamladdar's undertaking was true for the whole district. He replied that the orders declaring suspension in terms of the Mamladdar's letter had been already issued. I was not aware of it, but it was a fact that people's pledge had been fulfilled. The pledge, it will be remembered, had the same things for its object. And so we expressed ourselves satisfied with the orders. However, the end was far from making me happy in as much it lacked the grace with which the termination of every Satyagraha campaign ought to be accompanied. The collector carried on as though he had done nothing by way of settlement. The poor were to be granted suspension, but hardly got any benefit of, out of it. It was a poor's right, people's right to determine who was poor, but they could not exercise it. I was sad that they had not the strength to exercise the right. 
Although therefore the termination was celebrated as a triumph of Satyagraha, I could not enthuse over it as it lacked the essentials of a complete triumph. The end of Satyagraha campaign can be described as worthy only when it leaves the Satyagrahi stronger and more spirited than they are in the beginning. The campaign was not, however, without, without its indirect results, which we can see today and the benefit of which we are reaping. The Kheda Satyagraha marks the beginning of an awakening among the peasants of Gujarat, the beginning of their true political education. Dr. Besant's brilliant home rule agitation had certainly touched the peasants, but it was a Kheda campaign that compelled the educated public workers to establish contact with the actual life of the peasants. They learned to identify themselves with the latter. They found their proper sphere of work, the capacity for sacrifice increased. That Vallabhai found himself during this campaign was by itself no small achievement. We could realize its measure during the flood relief operations last year and the Badoli Satyagraha this year. Public life in Gujarat became instinct with a new energy and a new vigor. The Partidar peasant came to an unforgettable con consciousness of his strength. The les lesson was indelibly imprinted on the ma public mind that the salvation of the people depends upon themselves, upon their capacity for suffering and sacrifice. Through the Kheda campaign, Satyagraha took firm root in the soil of Gujarat. Although, therefore, I found nothing to enthuse over in the termination of the Satyagraha, Kheda peasants were jubilant because they knew they had achieved what they had achieved was commensurate with the effort and they had found the true and infallible method of for redress of their grievance. This knowledge was enough justification, justification for their jubilation. Nevertheless, the Kera peasants had not fully understood the inner meaning of Satyagraha and they saw it to their cause as we shall see in the chapters to follow. Passion for Unity The Kera campaign was launched while the deadly war in Europe was still going on. Now, Kaisers had arrived and the Viceroy had invited various leaders to a war conference in Delhi. I had also been urged to attend the conference. I had already referred to the cordial relations between Lord Kemsford, the Viceroy and myself. In response to the invitation, I went to Delhi. I had, however, objections to taking part in the conference, the principal one being the exclusion from it of leaders like the Ali brothers. They were then in jail. I had met them only once or twice, though I had heard much about them. I had met uh, uh, everyone had spoken highly of their services and their courage. I had not then come in close contact with Hakim Sahib, but Principal Rudra and Dina Bandhu Andrews had told me a great deal in his praise. I had met Shweb Qureshi and Mr. Khwaja at the Muslim League in Calcutta. I had also come in contact with Drs. Ansari and Abdul Rahman. I was seeking the friendship of good Muslims and was eager to understand the Muslim mind through contact with their purest and most patriotic representatives. I therefore ne never needed any pressure to go with I therefore never needed any pressure to go with them wherever they took me in order to get into intimate touch with them. I had realized early enough in South Africa that there was no genuine friendship between Hindus and Muslims. I never missed the a single opportunity to remove the obstacles in the way of unity. It was not in my nature to placate anyone by adulation or at the cost of self-respect, but my South African experiences had convinced me that it would be on the question of Hindu-Muslim unity that my Ahimsa would be put into its severest test and that the question presented the widest field for my experiments in Ahimsa. The conviction is still there. Every moment of my life, I realize that God is putting me on my trial. Having such strong convictions on the question, when I returned from South Africa, I prized the contact with the brothers. But before closer touch could be established, they were isolated. Maulana, Maulana Muhammad Ali used to write long letters to me from Baitul and Chindwara. Wherever his jailers allowed him to do, so, whenever his jailers allowed him to do so, I applied permissions to visit the brothers but to no purpose. It was after the imprisonment of the Ali brothers that I was invited by the Muslim friends to attend the session of the Muslim League at Calcutta. Being requested to speak, I addressed them on the duty of the Muslims to secure the brothers' release. A little after this, I was taken by these friends to the Muslim College at Aligarh. There I invited the young men to be fakirs for the service of the motherland. Every time I opened correspondence with the governor for the release of the brothers, Next, I opened the correspondence with the government for the release of the brothers. In that connection, I studied the brothers' views and the activities 
about the Khilafat. I had discussion with Musliman friends. I felt that if I would become a true friend of the Muslims, I must render all possible help of in securing the release of the brothers and a just settlement of the Khilafat question. It was not for me to enter into the absolute merits of the question, provided there was nothing immoral in their demands. In matters of religious beliefs, uh, differ and each one's is supreme for himself. If all had the same belief about all matters of religion, there would be only one religion in the world. As time progressed, I found that the Muslim demand for the Khilafat was not only against any, not only not against any ethical principle, but that the British Prime Minister had admitted the justice of the Muslim demand. I felt therefore bound to render what help I could in securing a due fulfillment of the Prime Minister's pledge. The pledge had been given in such clear terms that the examination of the Muslim demand on the merits was needed only to satisfy my own conscience. Friends and critics have criticized my attitude regarding the Khilafat question. In spite of the criticism, I feel that I should have no reason to revise it or regret my cooperation with the Muslims. I should adopt the same attitude should a similar occasion arise. When therefore I went to Delhi, I had fully intended to submit the Muslim case to the Viceroy. The Khilafat question had not then assumed the shape it did subsequently. But on my reaching to Delhi, another difficulty in the way of my attending the conference arose. Dina Bandhu Andrews raised a question about the morality of my participation in the war conference. He told me of the controversy in the British press regarding the secret treaties between England and Italy. How could I participate in the conference if England had entered into secret treaties with another European power? Asked Mr. Andrews. I knew nothing about the treaties. Dina Bandhu Andrews' word was good enough for me. I therefore addressed a letter to Lord Kemsford explaining my hesitation to take part in the conference. He invited me to discuss the question with him. I had a prolonged discussion with him and his private secretary, Mr. Maffey. As a result, I agreed to take part in the conference. This was in effect the Viceroy statement. Surely you do not believe that the Viceroy knows everything done by the British cabinet. I do not claim, no one claims that the British government is infallible. But you, you will agree that the empire has been on the whole a power for good. If you believe that India has on the whole benefited by the British connection, would you not admit that it is the duty of every Indian citizen to help the empire in the hour of its need? I too have read what the British papers say about the secret treaties. I can assure you that I know nothing beyond what the papers say. And you know the canards that these newspapers frequently start. Can you, acting on a mere newspaper report, refuse help to the empire at such a crucial juncture? You may raise whatever moral issues you like and challenge us as much as you please after the conclusion of the war, not today. The argument was not new. It appealed to me as new because of the manner in which and the hour at which it was presented. And I agreed to attend the conference as regards the Muslim demands I was to address a letter to the Viceroy recruiting campaign. So I attended the, the conference. The Viceroy was very keen on my supporting the resolution about recruiting. I asked for permission to speak in Hindi Hindustani. The Viceroy acceded to my request, but I suggested that I should also speak in English. I had no speech to make. I spoke but one sentence with a full sense of responsibility. I begged to support the resolution. Many congratulated me on having spoken in Hindustani. That was, they said, the first instance within living memory of anyone having spoken in Hindustani at such a meeting. The congratulations and the discovery that I was the first to speak in Hindustani at the vice regal meeting hurt my national pride. I felt like shrinking into myself. What a tragedy that the language of the country should be a taboo in meetings held in that country. For work related to the country and a speech there in Hindustani by a stray individual like myself should be a matter of congratulation. Incidents like these are reminders of the low state to which we have been reduced. The one sentence I uttered to, at the conference had for me considerable significance. It was impossible for me to forget either the conference or the resolution I supported. There was one undertaking that I had to fulfill while yet in Delhi. I had to write a letter to the Viceroy. This was no easy thing for me. I felt in my duty both in the interest of the government and of the people to explain 
therein how and why I attended the conference and to state clearly what the people expected from the government. In the letter, I expressed my regret for the exclusion of from the conference leaders like Lokmani Tilak and the Ali brothers and stated that our people's minimum political demand as also the demands of the Muslims on account of the situation created by the war. I asked for permission to publish that letter and the Viceroy gladly gave it. The letter had to be sent to Simla where the Viceroy had gone immediately after the conference. The letter for me had considerable importance and sending it by post could have meant delay. I wanted to save time and yet I was not inclined to send it by any messenger I came across. I wanted some pure man to carry it and hand it personally at the Vice Regal Lodge. Dina Bandhu, Andrews and Principal Rudra suggested the name of the good Reverend Ireland of the Cambridge Mission. He agreed to carry the letter if he might read it and if it appealed to him as good. I had no objection as the letter was by no means private. He read it, liked it and expressed his willingness to carry out the mission. I offered him the second class fare but he declined it saying that he was accustomed to travelling intermediate. This he did though it was a night journey. His simplicity and his straight and plain spoken manner captivated me. The letter thus delivered at the hands of a pure minded lad had as I thought the desired result, it eased my mind and cleared my way. The other part of my obligation consisted in raising recruits. Where could I make a beginning except in Kheda and whom could I invite to be the first recruits except my own co-workers? As soon as I reached Nadiad, I had a conference with Vallabha and other friends. Some of them could not be easy, could not easily take to the proposal. Those who liked the proposal had misgivings about its success. There was no love lost between the government and the classes to which I wanted to make my appeal. The bitter experience they had of the government officials was still fresh in their memory. And yet they were in favor of starting work. As soon as I set about my task, my eyes were opened. My optimism received a rude shock. Whereas during the revenue campaign, the people if readily offered their cards free of charge and two volunteers came forth when one was needed. It was difficult now to get a cart even on hire to say nothing of volunteers. But we would not be dismayed. We decided to dispense with the use of carts and do our journeys on foot. At this rate, we had to trudge about 20 miles a day if carts were not forthcoming. It was idle to expect people to feed us. It was hardly proper to ask for food. So it was decided that every volunteer must carry his food in his satchel. No bedding or sheet was necessary as it was summer. We had meetings wherever we went. People did attend, but hardly one or two would offer themselves as recruits. You are a votary of Ahimsa. How can you ask us to take up arms? What good has the government done for us to deserve our cooperation? These and similar questions used to be put up to us. However, our steady work began to tell. Quite a number of names were registered and we hoped that we should be able to have a regular supply as soon as the first match was sent. I had already begun to confer with the commissioner as to where the recruits were to be accommodated. The commissioner in every division Commissioners in every division were holding conferences on the Delhi model. One such was held in Gujarat. My co-workers and I were invited to it. We attended but I felt even less place for me there than at Delhi. In this atmosphere of servile submission, I felt ill at ease. I spoke somewhat at length but I could say nothing to please the officials and certainly one or two hard things to say. I used to issue leaflets asking people to enlist as recruits. One of the arguments I had used was distasteful to the commissioner. Among the many misdeeds of the British rule in India, history will look upon the act depriving a whole nation of arms as a blackest. If you want the arms act to be repealed, if you want to learn the use of arms, here is a golden opportunity. If the middle classes readily volunteer help to the government, if this are a trial, distrust will disappear and the ban on processing arms will be withdrawn. The commissioner referred to this and said that he appreciated my presence in the conference in spite of the differences between us and I had to justify my standpoint as courteously as I could. Here is a letter to the Viceroy referred to the above. As you are aware, after careful consideration, I felt constrained to convey to your excellency that I could not attend the conference for reasons stated in the letter of 26th instead of April. But after the interview, you, you were good enough to grant me. I persuaded myself to join it for no other cause than certainly out of my great regard for yourself. One of my reasons for absentation and perhaps the strongest was that Lokman, Tilak, Mrs. Besant and all the brothers 
whom I regarded amongst the most powerful leaders of public opinion were not invited to the conference. I still feel that it was a grave blunder not to have asked them and I respectfully suggest that the blunder might be possibly repaired if these leaders were invited to assist the government by giving it the benefit of their advice at the provincial conferences, which I understand are to follow. I venture to submit that no government can afford to disregard the leaders who represent the large masses of the people as they do, even though they may hold views fundamentally different. At the same time, it gives me pleasure to be able to say that the views of all parties were permitted to be freely expressed at the, commit at the committees of the conference. For my part, I purposely refrained from stating my views at the committee at which I had the honor of serving or at the conference itself. I felt that I could best serve the objects of the conference by simply tendering my support to the resolution submitted to it and I have done and this I have done without any reservation. I hope to translate the spoken word into action as early as the government can see its way to accept my offer which I am submitting simultaneously herewith in a separate letter. I recognize that in the hour of danger we must give as we have decided to give ungrudgingly and unequivocal support to the empire of which we aspire in the near future to be partners in the same sense as dominions overseas. But it is the simple truth that our response is due to the appreciation that our goal will be reached in all the most speedily. On that account, even as the performance of duty automatically confers a corresponding right, people are entitled to believe that the imminent reforms alluded to in your speech will embody the main, main general principles of the Congress League scheme. And I am sure that it is this faith that has enabled many members of the conference to tender to the government their full-hearted cooperation. If I could make my countrymen retrace their steps, I would make them withdraw all the Congress resolutions and not whisper home rule or responsible government during the pendency of the war. I would make the in I would make India offer all her able-bodied sons as a sacrifice to the empire at its critical moment. And I know that India by this very act would become the most favored partner in the empire and racial distinctions would become a thing of the past. But practically the whole of educated India has taken decided to take a less effective course and it is no longer possible to say that educated India does not exercise any influence on the masses. I have been coming into intimate con touch with the riots ever since my return from South Africa to India and I wish to assure you that the desire for home rule has widely penetrated them. I was present at the sessions of the last Congress and I was party to the resolution that a responsible government should be granted to the British, to British India within a period to be fixed definitely by a parliamentary statute. I admit that this is a bold step to take, but I feel sure that nothing less than a definite vision of home rule to be realized at the shortest possible time will satisfy the Indian people. I know that there are many in India who consider no sacrifice as too great in order to achieve the end, and they are wakeful enough to realize that they must be equally prepared to sacrifice themselves for the empire in the uh, hope that they and desire to reach their final status. It follows then that we can but accelerate our journey to the goal by silently and simply devoting ourselves heart and soul to the work of delivering the empire from the threatening danger. It will be a national suicide not to recognize this elementary truth. We must perceive that if we were to save the empire, we have in that act secured home rule. Whilst therefore it is clear to me that we should give to the empire every available man for its defense, I fear I cannot say the same thing about financial assistance. My intimate intercourse with the riots convinces me that India has already donated to the imperial exchequer beyond her capacity. I know that in making the statement, I'm voicing the opinion of the majority of my countrymen. The conference means for me and I believe for many of us a definite step in the cons consecration of our lives to the common cause, but ours is a particular position. We are today outside the partnership ours is a consecration based on the oops sorry ours is a consecration based on the hope of a better future i should be untrue to you and to my country if i did not clearly and unequivocally tell you that the hope is that that the hope is I do not bargain for its fulfillment, but you should know that disappointment of hope means disillusion. 
there is one thing i may not omit you have appealed to us to shrink domestic domestic differences if the appeal involves the total toleration of tyranny and the wrongdoing on the part of the officials i am powerless to respond i shall resist every organized tyranny to the uttermost the appeal must be to the officials that they do not ill treat a single soul and that they consult and respect popular opinion as never before in champaran by resisting an age old tyranny i have shown the ultimate sovereignty of british justice in kheda a population that was cursing the government now feels it now the government is the power when it is prepared to suffer for the truth it represents it is therefore losing its bitterness and is saying to itself that the government must be a government for the people for it tolerates orderly and respectful obedience disobedience where injustice is felt the champaran and kheda affairs are my direct definite and special contribution to the war ask me to suspend my activities in that direction and you ask me to suspend my life if i could popularize the use of soul force which is but another name for love force in the plate of place of brute force i know that it could present you with an india that could defy the whole world to do its worst in season and out of season therefore i shall discipline myself to express in my life this eternal law of suffering and present it for acceptance to those who care and if i take part in any other activity the motive is to show the matchless superiority of that law lastly i would like you to ask his majesty's ministers to give a definite assurance of what mohammedan states i am sure you know that every mohammedan is deeply interested in them as a hindu i cannot be indifferent to their cause their sorrows must be our sorrows in the most scrupulous regards for the rights of those states and of the muslim sentiment as to their places of worship and your just and timely treatment of india's claim to home rule lies safety of the empire i write this because i love the english nation and i wish to evoke in every indian the love loyalty of englishmen okay with this we come to the end of uh, this reading uh, this reading has happened across four different days i've still not sorted out the uh, issues of my camera i think i've sorted out now uh, hopefully from the next reading it will be consistent so let me try and recap whatever has happened in the last uh, four readings which are going to be crunched into this video uh, what has happened is gandhi has successfully uh, completed an act of civil disobedience when he went on fast and he uh, ensured that the uh, kheda satyagraha campaign uh, was successful and the mill owners agreed after 21 days of protest to the uh, claims made by gandhi and and uh, the mill workers uh, so this is one um, one more one more feather on gandhi's shoulder uh, or feather in his cap <laughs> and uh, so that's the first part of the reading the second part of the reading was on the learnings that he acquired and the learnings that people had acquired uh, even after the campaign was ended there was some controversy about how the sweets were being distributed when the free sweets were distributed to the people so he realized that satyagraha is, is a lifelong pursuit and it is and and it requires a certain level of discipline which people are not completely ready for but gandhi is uh, doing it for the long run and he is convinced that he would get there uh, the second part of uh, the reading was about his relations with muslims uh, gandhi is obviously enamored by the ali brothers and the work that they do from the time he came from south africa he has been in correspondence with them he could never go and meet them as they were in jail and their letters to him were only uh, received by him when the jail officials allowed them to be allowed them to write now uh, uh, while all this was happening gandhi had kind of successfully uh, finished the campaign at uh, at kheda and uh, what was the other place amdavad i guess and gandhi was also working in this ashram he had moved on to a better place in amdavad and uh, um the funds in terms of uh, his moments uh, funds for his moments were pouring in quite well from the gujaratis in bombay and uh, so money was no longer an issue and gandhi's political career therefore was moving quite well with a lot of news now unlike champaran which was in a far flung village kheda and amdavad were uh, mainstream areas and the news was spreading wide and far 
uh, Gandhi was then invited to a conference about the war in Delhi by Lord Kemsford and the Viceroy of India. Now Gandhi had a very cordial and friendly relations with both of them so he agreed to go there. Gandhi also uh, took the opportunity to go to Calcutta and attend the Muslim League conference. He uh, gave a nice speech in the conference asking the Muslims to fight for the release of the Ali brothers and uh, uh, yeah so that was his point. Uh, when, then he reached Delhi and in Delhi he realized uh, his contact there, his very close buddy Dina Bandhu Andrews gave him the news that it might not be sensible for Gandhi to attend the conference because there was news that England was getting into secret treaties with Italy and so if it, the government was uh, having uh, uh, agreements with another European power what leverage would they have in terms of supporting uh, from India. So Gandhi uh, realized the argument there. So he wrote a letter to uh, Lord Kemsford. Lord Kemsford said that before you take any decision, come and meet, him, meet me. And so they had a long discussion. Gandhi agreed to go and meet him and they had a long discussion. Uh, he said that, uh, oh, this is the Viceroy. The, vice, uh, the, the Viceroy said that, do you expect me to know everything that happens in the Indian, uh, in the British Empire and and I'm not saying that the British uh, Empire is infallible, it's just that uh, if there was any kind of uh, treaty between England and Italy, which I don't know about, uh, uh, and I, if I get to know, I would let you know, but there is nothing like that, and that has no link with your support. Uh, uh, I, we are looking at you for helping us recruit more people. Gandhi is convinced. Uh, are you convinced? So he asked him, are you convinced about the about the, the goodness of the British Empire or how good the British Empire has been to his people. We, whatever your complaints, whatever your grudges, uh, whatever your moral compunctions might be, we can address that after the war. This is a period where you have to uh, urge the Indian people to give, to support the British cause, the cause of the British Empire in the war. Now Gandhi obviously was convinced about this and he said that I will try and do what I can but I cannot promise on the on behalf of the educated Indian masses uh, or rather the educated Indians as they have a lot of grievances against the British Empire. Gandhi uh, 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 attended the conference. He gave a one line uh, uh, speech there which he made in Hindi slash Hindustani. Uh, which was that I beg to support the resolution. The resolution was for participating in the world war. Now he uh, got a lot of appreciation for having spoken in Hindi which he saw ironically he was not very happy about it because he realized that this was the first time somebody had spoken in Hindi for an issue which involved India as a country and had spoken in India. So while he also had done it in English the fact that he got appreciation only for the Hindi one they made him realize that till now we uh, this is the lowest standard that we have and anything that I do is being appreciated because nobody has done this before. Uh, anyway, coming back to uh, helping in recruitment, Gandhi went to the place where he thought he would get the maximum support which is in Kheda and uh, Gandhi was uh, later realized that it, this campaign was not like any of his other campaigns. Wherever he, he wanted to uh, do a large movement uh, or an agitation or a strike, he would automatically get people and funds and if he wanted uh, a cart uh, with one person, he'll get two for it. But in this particular case, he did not get that. He did not get that support. People are not interested in supporting the British Empire. He met people like Vallabhai Patel who also had misgivings but Gandhi kind of convinced them. And he said that if we do not get a cart, we will go walk on foot and they would cover about 20 miles a day, having meetings at every place. Slowly and steadily, people started pouring in. One or two recruits came in and he was able to build in some momentum for the campaign. Uh, yeah, so this is where I'm going to end my <laughs> uh, analysis today. Um, I'll try and tie this video up and post it. Um, like I said, uh, I hope that with this uh, with this video onwards, I think the next few videos we will try and do it without any hitch, and uh, I will do a upgradation of my hardware 
to record better videos uh, thank you very much and if you have any suggestions apart from the camera issue uh, please do write to me if you want me to start looking at other books to read do write to me and uh, i will see you in the next video till then goodbye